Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for SAT. We have been solving SAT math problems out of this book here, the SAT Official Study Guide 2020. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Make sure you buy 2020 edition and not the older one. Today we will begin a new exam, exam number 8 I believe, that you will find on page number 591. Turn to it, page 591, always make sure the book is in front of you so you can follow the work. As you, always, as, as you already know, in the, first, in the beginning the first few questions are quite simple, quite straightforward. So let's, let's get going. If at the end of the video you find it helpful and you decide that you would like to work with me, you can always get hold of me at Kishwani Prep by sending me an email at kishwaniprep at icloud.com. Let's look at the very first problem. 3x plus x plus x plus x plus 6x. 6x and minus 5, we are told is equal to 7 plus 2x. We just have to solve for x, so bring the x to all the other side. Subtract 2x from both sides. Add 5 to both sides, quite straightforward. 2x is going to drop out, 5s are going to drop out. 6x minus 2x is 4x equals 12, there you go, and x is equal to 3. Nothing to it, straightforward, simple. What else you what else do we expect? It's number one. Number two. In number two, we are given a graph and we are being asked to identify the appropriate equation that corresponds with the graph. And the graph looks something like this. Here is our time, which is measured in minutes. And here is the distance, which is uh, represented with letter D. And what we notice is that the graph intersects the x-axis, x and y, it goes to the origin. It has no y-intercept. This graph that is present to it has no y-intercept. And the answer choices that are given to us, as you can clearly see, answer choice C has the y-intercept of 2. This one has no y-intercept, C is wrong. And answer choice D has a y intercept of 2, that is wrong. It has, to, it has to be either A or a B, and this is where you have to pay attention. It's a very simple thing. The only way you're going to make a mistake on this thing if you, is, is that if you're being careless. We know, we know slow is equal to rise over run. Rise over run, or put another way, it is a change in y over the change in x, not the other way around. Slope tells you how much y, how much does the independent variable change for each one unit change in the, or rather the other way around, how much the dependent variable y changes for each one unit change in the independent variable x. That's what that is. And if you look at the graph, if you look at the graph, you see the very first one that tells you is that when x is equal to 1, y is equal to 2. So the change in y is 2 units for each one unit change in x. I'm explaining too much here. The slope is 2 here, not half. The half is those people, half, this half is for those, those people who are not, paying, are not paying attention and they end up taking the reciprocal of it. It is the change in y over the change in x, not the other way around. So the slope is 2, y intercept is 0, the answer is A. Number 3. In number 3 we are given an equation which looks something like this. What the problem actually says, you can read it all of, all of the mumbo jumbo yourself, I'm not going to bother with that. The bottom line is this is an equation and we're being asked to solve for, solve for P. As I said, the rest of the stuff is just mumbo jumbo, it is of no interest to us. Let's solve for P. So let's multiply both sides by 6. So we're going to get 6E equals to O plus 4M plus P. And since we want to solve for P, bring the 4M and the O on the other side and we're done. So P must equal to 60 minus 4M and minus O. There you go. Okay. The rest of the stuff you're not worried about, we're not concerned about as to what the equation represents. You could care less about it. Number 4. Number 4. Number 4 is a geometry problem, 
And the problem looks something like this. Let's see what we can do here. It looks something like this. We are told that this angle is 31 degrees. This is given to us. And what we want to find out is this angle, rather, x degrees. This is what we find out. We want to find out what x is equal to. That's the bottom line. What else we are told here? We must, we must have been told something else. We are also told that this angle is 114. And finally, the most important part, we are told that RT equals to TU. And the R is here, T is here, this, this point right here, and the U is right here. And that's a very important bit of information, without it, which we are not, not, which are, which not going to go anywhere. So let's begin. We can begin in any sequence we want. It makes absolutely no difference in which sequence you go about, as long as your logic is correct, as long as your math is correct. So let's, let's begin. I'm going to start with the easiest one. This is 114, which means this angle that you see there, because it's a straight line, it has to add up to 180. Let's figure out this part here. 180 minus 114, that will be 6. And 7 minus 1 is 6 again. Am I making a mistake? 66. Well, that makes sense. 66 plus 4 is 70, and 70 plus 110 is 180. It is 66. I don't know why I was doubting myself. So that part is done. So this angle is 66. This is 31. Now we can figure out this other angle in this top triangle here. Let's find out. 66 plus 31. 66 plus 31 is going to be 7 and 9. So this angle here, had it been 100, had this sum been 100, this angle would have been 80 because they have to add up to 80. It's not 100, it's 97. So instead of, instead of 100, it's going to be 103. Oh no, rather, it, since it's not 100, it's 97. So instead of this being 80, it's going to be 83. It's going to be 3 more than 80. 83. Now, if that angle is 83, that angle also has to be 83 because they are vertical angles. So this is 83. You just have to take your time. That's it. Now we are stuck here. The only way we can figure out x is by knowing what this angle is, angle r. And that's where this is going to come in handy, this information, that rt, r to t, let me put it in a different color so we can see it. We are told that triangle, we are told that the triangle r, t, u, is an isosceles triangle, which means this angle has to equal that angle. But we also know we are given this angle, 114. Well, there we are done then. If that is 114, we already figured out that 114 minus 180 minus 114 is 66. We don't have to redo it. The remaining part is 66, and that, that 66 has to split evenly between these two angles because this side, RT, is equal to TU. It's an isosceles triangle. So, if this is 66, this has to be 33, this has to be 33, and we are done. Let's add up 83 and 33, which is 6, 111, and therefore the x must be, x must be 180 minus 116, minus 116. Instead of 116, had it been 120, the difference would have been 60. 180 minus 120 would have been 60. But it is not 120, it is only 116, which means the difference instead of being 60, it's going to be 64. It's going to be 64. The angle that we're looking for is 64, and the answer is C. And like I said, the only way we're going to get it wrong is if you're not paying attention. That's the only reason you will get it wrong, because otherwise the concept here is very simple. There are only two very simple concepts that are being tested here. One is that the sum of the angle in, a, in, a, in any given triangle has to add up to 180. And the second concept that we're testing here is that the vertical angles are equal. Other than that, there is nothing in it. There are no tricks, nothing. Oh, and we have to also understand the concept of isosceles triangle, that the other two sides have to be equal. So I guess there are, there are more than a couple of, couple of concepts, but simple concepts. Number five. We are told that the width is W feet. We are told further that the length in this rectangle that we're going to talk about, our length is 6 feet longer than the width. 
And the question simply is, how much is the parameter? You have to express, express the parameter in terms of W. Let me read this question exactly how it's phrased. It does, it does what it must say actually. It says, yeah, in terms of W. It says, what is the parameter in terms of W? Let's find out, shall we? So here's our width, our length. Here's our length, which we are told is 6 feet longer than W. So length must be W plus 6. There you go. So the perimeter is 2 times W plus the 2 times the length, which we know, which we know is W plus 6. There you go. You just have to simplify it. So here we have, here we have 2 here, 2 W, here we have on the 2 W, so that's 4 W plus 12. 4W plus 12 is the answer, and that answer choice is B. Number 6. Number 6. Now we're getting into the medium question as we get into number 6. Do you understand? The good times are over. Here we are told that y is equal to 2x minus 1. 2x minus, not equal to rather, we are told that the y is greater than 2x minus 1 and we are further told that 2x is greater than 5. That's the question asking number 6. Oh, we simply have to identify uh, the value of y. How does y work out to be? Well, let's find out, shall we? Well, first thing we notice is that here, here we have a minus 1. Is 2x is the same. Here we have 2x, here we have 2x, but here we have minus 1, but here we do not. Why don't we subtract 1 from here? So now we have the same bloody thing on both sides. There you go. So this tells us that 2x minus 1, 2x minus 1 has to be greater than 5 minus 1, which is 4, and 2x minus 1, 2x minus 1 in turn we are told is greater than y. 2x minus 1 we are told is greater than y, right here. But there you go. This is what we conclude, that y must be more than 4. y has to be greater than 4, because if a is bigger than b and b is bigger than c, then a must be bigger than c, obviously. Let's carry on, shall we? Number 7. In number 7 we are told here that the root of 2x plus 6 plus 4 plus is equal to x plus 3. Here we are dealing with a concept called principal root. And what the principal root tells us is that whenever we have an algebraic expression, whenever, whenever we have algebraic expression, algebraic expression under the root sign or any root sign, square root, cube root, for fourth root, doesn't matter, any, any root sign. If you have an algebraic expression under the root sign, this quantity has to be positive. This cannot be a negative quantity. This quantity cannot be negative. Do you understand? And we have dealt, we have dealt with this concept, we have come across with it twice before, and I'm going to tell you where we came across it before, so that you can, uh, you can go back and take a look at it, so to understand it. So we came across it on page number 463, on day 460 let's go in systematic way on day on day 2 page 337 and we came across it again on day 13 on page 463 in other words at least one question appears in every exam dealing with this concept we came across one question in exam number one and we came across another question in exam number two and this is exam number three. Now when, when I say exam number one, two and three what I actually mean is ten, eight and nine as you know ten, nine and eight as you know that they're going in reverse reverse order. The very first question in the book is exam number ten then the nine and the eight. So this is ten, this is nine, this is eight. So this, quant this quantity cannot be negative. That's the only thing we have to understand it and if you understand that concept the rest is very simple. The rest is very simple, very straightforward. So now that we understand that, we can begin the process. Let's bring the 4 to the other side. So we end up with square root of 2x plus 6 has to equal x 
you bring 4 to the other side, it becomes minus 1 plus 3 and negative 4, that's all. And then at this point, instead of actually, we could actually, we could actually square this both sides to get rid of the root sign, and if you square the both sides, this will turn into a second power, bring everything to the other side, and, and solve this thing uh, like a bloody quadratic equation that it is. However, that, that will be a sheer waste of time. Let's just plug in numbers. Let's just plug in the answer choices. Let's just plug in the answer choices. It can't be that bad. The first answer choice is negative 1. So let's just plug in negative 1. Answer choice A says negative 1. So 2 times negative 1 plus 6, it says, has to equal negative 1 minus negative 1. As you, as you can immediately tell that this is not going to work out. This is not going to work out because this quantity we already said cannot be negative. And this one says that this quantity is negative 2. It is not right. It doesn't matter how things will work out. Negative 2 and a positive 6 is going to be positive 4. And it says it's equal to negative 2. Now the reason why people get it wrong is because ordinarily, ordinarily, in ordinary situation, if you if you have a numerical value here as opposed to algebraic expression, for example, if somebody simply walks up to you and asks you how much is the square root of 9, the correct answer is indeed the square root of 9 is either positive 3 or negative 3. They are both acceptable because the square of both of those quantities will give us 9. So therefore people might end up thinking the square root of 4 is positive 2 and negative 2, which is true, square root of 4 is positive 2 or negative 2, and negative 2 would equal negative 2. But we are not dealing with square root of 4, we are dealing with square root of this quantity. It cannot be negative. It cannot be negative. So this, can, this is only allowed to be positive 2, and positive 2 does not equal negative 2. So the answer to A is wrong. Let's look at B. B says x is equal to 5. B says x is equal to 5. If x is equal to 5, we're going to get 10 plus, if x is equal to 5, we're going to get 5 plus 2, 5 times 2 is 10 plus, I'm just going to write it down instead of doing it out, and this is going to be 5 minus 1. And this is allowed to be only positive 4, and that's exactly what we get here. There you go, it works. The answer is B. The answer is B. Now we don't have to worry about C or D, because both in C and D, both in C and D, negative 1 appears. Negative 1 appears as the acceptable value of x, and we just established that the answer choice A, the negative 1 does not work. Negative 1 ends up giving us negative root, and negative roots, roots are not permitted. So the answer is B. Besides, the answer would have to be B because it, it works here. So that was number 7, and it dealt with the concept of principal root, is what it's known as. Make sure you go back and take a look at uh, problem number 15 on page 463 and problem number 14 on page 337. Let's look at number 8. Number 8, we are given f of x, we are told, is equal to x cubed minus 9x. And g of x, we are told, is equal to x squared minus 2x minus 3. And the question simply is, what's the value of fx, I'm not going to write it here, fx over gx. So let's just, let's just simplify first. We, we want to find out the value of fx over gx. Okay. This is very straightforward. x cubed and 9x, we can take out the x common. And we end up with x squared minus 9. And after that, we have to recognize that there's a difference of two squares. This is x squared minus 3 squared, which is the same as a squared minus b squared. So this is simply x plus 3 and x minus 3. Let's look at gx. Let's look at gx. gx is x squared minus 2x minus 3. So here, we look. if you're going to factorize it, we're looking for two numbers such that their difference is negative 2 and their product is negative 3, which is simply negative 3 and a positive 1. Negative 3 and a positive 1. Negative 3x and positive x will give us negative 2x, and negative 3x times positive x is going to give us negative 3x squared. These two have a common factor of x, and these two have nothing in common except positive 1. And now we can take out x minus 3 common, and here we are left with x, and here we are left with positive 1. And that is our g of x. The rest is very easy. We put one on top of the other. 
and off we go. So f of x over g of x, f of x is this guy right here, and g of x we just found out this, plus x plus 1, not plus rather, times, there you go, x minus x minus 3 should drop out, this should have been x minus 3, x plus 3 and x minus 3, that should have dropped out. Because otherwise nothing would cancel the way I wrote it, I wasn't paying attention. x minus 3 drops out, and there is your answer. Answer is x times x plus 3 over x plus 1, and there is answer choice B. Take a look at number 9. Oh, number 9 is a geometry problem. We are given an equation of this circle. And we also told that the point, point P has a coordinates of 10 and negative 5 is on the circle. We are also told that the distance PQ is the diameter. The question is, based on the fact that distance P to Q is the diameter, and given the equation of the circle that we have, what are the coordinates of point Q? Let's find out, shall we? That can be difficult. Now here, we could actually figure out the center of the circle, which is going to be positive 6 and negative 5, but it's not necessary. The only thing that matters is the radius here. The only thing that matters is the fact that the radius is 4, 4 squared. So let's just draw a circle with a radius of 4. With a radius of 4. And now, just put down point P and see what happens. Point P is here, 10 and negative 5. Now the question is, if that's the case, and if P to Q, PQ, distance PQ is the diameter, we go straight across to the center, and we'll reach the point Q. So the, the coordinates of point Q are going to be, if this is 10, plus 4, plus 4, it's going to be 18. 18 and negative 5. That's it. Those are the coordinates of point Q. We're done. And what is the answer choice? This is question number 9. Question number 9. Aha! We got a problem here. The problem is that none of the answer choices gives us this value. It is not wrong, though that is the legitimate coordinates of point Q if point P were here. If point P if point P were here, that's the proper English, were, is hypothetical. That is not the case, obviously, because had that been the case, the point coordinates of Q would have been these two coordinates, and that would have been one of the answer choices. And this is not one of the answer choices, which means point P is not here, point P is here, it's the other way around. So let's do it, let's just redo it, instead of crying, instead of crying about it, let's just redo it, let's put point P here. 10 and negative 5, and we're going to put point Q here, there you go, now we can figure out the coordinates of point Q, and whatever the coordinates works out to be, it's going to be one of the answer choices, because it has to be, because those, those are the only two possibilities, either P is here and Q is there, or the other way around, what else? So let's find out, shall we? So now, if the X coordinate is 10 here, we are going to the left, minus 4, minus 4, there you go, it's going to be 2, and negative 5. And that has to be one of the answer choices. 2 and negative 5 has to be one of the answer choices. Number 9, is it? Oh, it's answer choice A, the very first one. There we go. Number 10, shall we? The very last one on the page. Let's take a look at it.
number 10. Number 10 says that we have a total of 202 people. Total of 202 people. And they're going camping. They're going camping and they have taken two kinds of tents with them. One tent that can accommodate two people and a bigger tent that can accommodate four people. So let's call, let's, let's, let's use letter T. Let T represent the number of number of two person tents that we brought with us and let S F represent the number of four person tent that's it and the question simply is how many of the tents for two persons so we're looking for T we're looking for T, but we must we must be given something else. Because so far we only have one equation out of that. What else is given to us? We need two independent equations to solve for two variables, obviously. I must have missed something. Oh, they're taking 60 tens altogether. There you go, that's an important bit of information. Our total of total of 60 tens. There you go, that's our second equation. This is our second equation. So if you're calling, if you're going to use T to represent the number of two percent tent, and F to represent the number of four percent tents that we brought with us, then we are told the total number of tents we have is sixty. There you go. This is our second equation. And we're solving for T, so we're going to find out what T is from here, or rather F is from here. F is equal to sixty minus T, and we're going to put it back in this equation, which has to do with the fact that we have two hundred and two people. Let's do it here. So we have a total of 202 people and they are all in 2% tent or 4% tents and we have T number of 2% tents so 2 times T represents the number of people who are sleeping in the 2% tent because each of them has 2 people in it and also we are told that's why you have to have the book in front of you because I do not put down every nitty gritty in the blackboard. What I left out is a very important bit of information. We are told in the problem that it is filled to capacity and nobody is sleeping outside the tent. The, my, the details. So since it's filled to capacity, this represents the number of people who are sleeping in the two person tent and four times F because each each tent represent each each tent accommodates four people, four times F would represent the number of people who are sleeping in the four person tent. There you go. We have two independent equations, two unknown, we can solve for we can solve for T. And F we know is 60 times C, we're gonna put it in here. But before we do that, let's just reduce the work a little bit. I just noticed that this is 202, this is 2, this is 4. Why don't we divide the bloody thing by 2 first, so that we have to do less math. Less math. 101, let's divide the whole thing by 2. T plus 2 times F, 2 times F, which is 60 minus T. So T plus 120 minus 2T, 101. Oh, there you go. T minus 2T is negative T, and 101 minus 120 would be negative 19. There you go. T equals 19. Oh, that was quite painless. That wasn't so bad. We'll meet again tomorrow, and we'll pick up from where we left off. We'll begin with question number 11, obviously, tomorrow. In the meantime, if you wish to get hold of me, as I told you before at the beginning of the video, you can always do that by sending me an email at kishwadiprep at icloud.com. Okay, bye now.